Hi everyone, welcome back to the Trayline Podcast, brought to you by DFU. I'm your host, Richard Moglin, and joining me today is Jason Shapiro, a hedge fund manager and trader with over 30 years of experience. He was also featured in Jack Schreider's latest Market Wizards book. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for being here, and welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, glad, glad you're here. And to start things off, I'd love to hear about kind of your journey as a trader, how you first got interested in the markets, and how you kind of developed your own process. So I guess I always kind of had an interest in the markets. My dad uh, was involved and then, you know, I went to school for uh, finance and had sort of that sort of interest as a student would have um, without really knowing what any of that meant. But, uh, you know, started reading a lot of books, you know, obviously started with the Warren Buffett stuff and all that. And um, then I started trading when I first started working. My first job was as a banker um, in Hong Kong, and uh, I was pretty bored with it. And um, one of my friends was a uh, a broker mm -hmm. that was doing a lot of Hang Seng Index features, and he got me involved with that. Um, and I went out and sort of started reading a bunch of books. So the first book I got, which was a coincidence, but was, I guess, the bestseller at that time was Jack Schwager's first book, Market Wizards. And I read that and um, it really kind of struck a chord with me. You know, it made sense to me. I, I liked what the people were saying. It made sense. And clearly I liked the idea showing how young and ignorant I was, but I liked the idea of the lifestyle yeah. um, of the whole thing. And um, it just kind of went from there. It's been a journey from there. And were within that first uh, Market Wizards book, were there any traders who really um, you really resonated with, and you're like, I kind of want to try their style and and you know learn more about how they trade? I think that the ones that really resonated with me were the the Commodities Corp guy, Kovner, uh, Paul Tudor Jones. You know, um, those things that those guys were saying. Although there were a lot of things in that book that made a lot of sense to me, but it, I, when I think about it in particular, those two uh, really resonated with me. Yeah. And the the first time you read it, obviously, you know, I'm sure you, you learned quite a bit, but did it take multiple reads to kind of for those core messages to get cemented in about risk management and, you know, how to approach the market as a professional, or did you kind of get it in one go? No, I mean, I, I probably read that book 50 times. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and I still go back sometimes and read some of the stuff from some of the Market Wizards books. Um, so I think it's a consistent learning process. Yeah. And outside of Market Wizards, were there any books that um, really, you know, helped you along your way? Or you think just traders watching this, uh, you know, you'd recommend them read that because you think it's some really valuable stuff? I think that the... Um, in particular, the first three Market Wizards books, at least for me, you know, like Stock Market Wizards, I'm, I'm not really a stock trader, mm -hmm. um, but the first three, which were Market Wizards, Market Wizards 2, or I forget what the second one's called, maybe New Market Wizards or something, and Hedge Fund Market Wizards, yeah. um, I, I think that those three books uh, are extremely valuable. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, moving past books, um, I'd love to hear if there are any kind of time periods in uh, your, your trading journey that really taught you a lot, whether it was a particular market cycle, because obviously you've seen the 90s, you've seen the, what happened after the 90s, uh, you've seen the 2008 bear market. Um, what have been the most meaningful market cycles that you've been through? And if you could share any kind of key lessons from, from different periods, that would be great as well. I think that, and I talk a little bit, I think about this in Jack's book, but some of the things that really had an effect on me were... Um, at one point, I went to school for a year in London, um, and I was trading the Hang Seng Index futures from London. This was pre, I wouldn't call it pre-internet, but really right when the internet was first starting, so it wasn't very useful. Um, so I was getting like faxed every day, the daily chart from my broker and all that, and I was trading around and trying to like, you know, short-term trade and all that, and I was doing okay. But uh, at one point, I was going during Christmas break, I went to Africa for a month and this was pre cell phone as well. Yeah. Um, so I was for whatever reason, bullish to Hang Seng index and I was long and I just told my broker, look, stop me out here. Otherwise I'll, I'll call you in a month, you know, and I called him in a month and the market was up like, you know, 15%. And 
Um, I made more money on that one trade by not being there than I made all year kind of putzing around, you know, day trading. So I think that that was a, a big lesson for me. Um, I would say another big one for me was, I want to say it was 96, 97, somewhere in there. Um, I had finished school and I was trading um, my own account and I was trying to be Mr. Contrarian and the market was going up and, and I was shorting it. And this is when Greenspan came out and said, you know, irrational exuberance, which you're probably too young to remember. But, um, and I was like, oh yeah, look at me, you know, me and Greenspan are the only ones that know what's going on. And the market just kept going up and I, I kept losing money and I, I was stuck in this trade. The psychology of being stuck in the short and now not wanting to miss it in case it, uh, in case it happens. And I, gee, I've been short this whole time. I'm not going to, you know, um, that whole psychology and that whole thing, I think also taught me a lot yeah. of lessons. And then a big thing for me um, was the late nineties internet boom, in particular, the second half of 99 where um, everybody that you ran into was talking about how much money they were making in the stock market. It was like, that was the thing to do was be trading these internet stocks and me sort of being theoretically Mr. Contrarian, I was trying to short it. And it was the classic, you know, um, the shoeshine boys giving stock tips and they were, um, but you know what? And I was shorting it. I was trying to short it the whole second half of 1999. And, um, the market went up, the Nasdaq went up 50% in the second half, right? So the idea that, yes, these people will lose money, but that doesn't mean they're going to start losing money today, you know, right. and the importance of patience and waiting for things like market confirmation right. before you get short or before you make any trade um, is very important, which is something that, that came to me at that point. Which is also, by the way, when I came across the commitment to traders uh, data right then, because the commitments to traders of data, as it turned out, I didn't know then, but I know now, really wouldn't have given you a sell signal in the NASDAQ until uh, early 2000. It would have mm -hmm. kept you from being short all the way through that whole part of 1999. And that really struck me as something that I need. You know, if you're trying to be contrarian, you can get run over. So that's a data point that that really helps me now, at the very least, stay out of trouble. Yeah, and I definitely want to touch on your COT uh, charts later on. Uh, but first, I'd love to just kind of hear you kind of talk through, you know, how you view your own style and your own process, because many of the viewers of this of this uh, channel, um, they're they're mostly trading equities. A lot of them grow stocks, momentum, technology, uh, whatever. Um, not many of them are involved in as many markets as you and, and trading, you know, different things and kind of hedging positions. So I love to hear you kind of walk through your process and, and how you view your kind of overall strategy. So I think the simplest way to, to view it um, is the idea that a very large percentage of people lose money over time trading. Um, so what I want to do is capture their losses as my gains. So therefore, I'm trying to measure what they are doing and trying to take the opposite side. It's really that simple. You know, I'm not trying to be smarter than the whole market, right? My analysis is, you know, is not going to be smarter. I'm just really trying to find where the people who have a high percentage chance of losing money, what they're doing and, and take and make a market to them, take the opposite side. It's really all I'm trying to do. Um and when they all line up and I, I find here's a whole bunch of people that have a history of losing money over time and they're all doing the same thing here, uh, then I'm looking to go the other way. And and you mentioned this previously, even if you have that contrarian opinion, you're always waiting for the market to give you a sign, give you confirmation that your opinion is right. Uh, I know you've talked about, you know, news failures and, and big upside reversal bars and that type of thing. Can you talk a little bit about how you wait for the market to kind of confirm your, your hypothesis? Yeah. So if there's something I'm trying to buy or sell, um, because I think it's a contrarian trade, um, I'm now trying to look into why people are buying or selling that, right? What's the news behind that? Okay, let's say, I don't know, let's make something up. People are getting long oil because, uh, you know, oil inventories are dropping and there's a war and, you know, whatever there is, right? Yeah. 
So now I know what's pushing the market up theoretically. So I'm waiting for a piece of news to come out that confirms that whole idea. Right. All right. So here's a lower oil inventory number, even lower than people were expecting. So that's bullish oil. Right. And then the market doesn't go up on that. Right. And that's to me, market confirmation. And that's where I would try and short it. Yeah. And a great example, you know, was the CPI, you know, the most recent bottom in the market, the CPI number came out and we had a huge upside reversal bar on the indexes. And that's what kind of started this most recent rally. Um, you know, that that's another kind of good example of a news failure. Is that right? I think that's a great example. Yeah. That was the exact low of the stock market, at least to this point, um, was that higher than expected CPI and the highest CPI of the entire cycle. Right. Um, and the market traded down on that and then ended up closing up on the day. And that, as it turned out, turned out to be the exact low. Yeah. And at least on, now. Yeah, up until now. And and that was on 1013, I, I believe. Um, and I'd love to hear, you know, on a day like that, where you, you see that news failure, uh, when are you looking to enter? Do you enter as it's kind of, um, do you enter at the end of the day or are you waiting or, or are, you, are you entering a little bit earlier than that when we do see, you know, that failure that as this market goes against the expectations? Most of the time, I will wait until the close for it to be confirmed because you get a lot of intraday moves that can, you yeah. know, fake you out, right? Um, once in a while, I will, if I have a very strong feeling, if I hear some people on TV that are giving guarantees, you know, that type of thing, I might start to put it on earlier in the day. Yeah. Maybe I'll put on a 10% position, you know, early. And if it starts going my way, I might add to it into the close. But most of the time, I'm really waiting for the close. Yeah. And how are you managing risk on these type of trades? Uh, are you putting in stops or is it more about your position size or or a combination of both as well? No. So it all comes off of that. So um, if the idea is here's the market that failed here, that should be the low, right? right. You know, here's somebody who was waiting 10 months in this case to short it. And he shorted it on that CPI number. To me, that person should never make money. So that should be the low. So that's what I'm trading against is that low number, a low of that day. So I know where I enter. I know where the lower the day is, and that's going to be my stop. So therefore, I size the position between those two things to lose whatever percentage I'm willing to lose on a trade, which in my case is 70 basis points mm -hmm. of my portfolio, mm -hmm. um, which basically gets my portfolio to about an eight vol, which is what I'm targeting. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives sort of all of those things uh, in the trade. Yeah. And, you know, a common thing I see uh, for people who who want to be kind of contrarian is, you know, they're looking at a market that's oversold. It's in a downtrend. It's in a downtrend. It continues down, down, down. And, you know, they're trying to take longs at all these different points. But, you know, just because it's a market's oversold doesn't mean it can't continue lower, right? So I, I think that's a, a difficult concept for people to grasp, but you're kind of waiting for that key moment where it reverses and shows that the character has kind of has uh, kind of changed in the market. So I'd love to hear you kind of talk about that and how you view both oversold as well as overbought and how you take that into, your, into account into your process. So I think that the term oversold, overbought is a price thing, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, I think trading off of price is, is pretty dangerous. Um, you know, I trade off of participation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that, hey, the market's oversold here on a 14-day RSI or whatever. It's everybody is short here. So I'm looking to go the other way. And now the market's not going down on, the, on bad news anymore. So I do it. But so trading overbought, oversold can be very dangerous. I mean, just look at the, the perfect example right now is natural gas, right? Mm -hmm. Um Natural gas was hugely oversold at the beginning of this year. Um, and it's gone down 45% since. Yeah. You know, and everybody, I, I keep saying on my like uh on my newsletter, not a day goes by, and I'm not exaggerating, not a day goes by that either someone is telling me they're buying natural gas or someone's asking me if they should buy natural gas. And that's been for the last six months. Yep. Things down like 60% in six months, right? And I haven't had one person tell me that they were shorting it. Yeah. So oversold can be very, very dangerous. Yep. You know, what happens when you buy something that's oversold and it goes down? Well, now it's more oversold. Are you supposed to buy more? 
you know, it can get you, it can put you in a very, very dangerous position. It can work sometimes too, right? But when it doesn't work, it can blow you out. So, yeah. And uh, from, from what you just said, uh, I, I gather that you never, never, ever average down on a position. I do not. And nor do I average up. I, yeah. I get my position for me. I, I put my positions on, on that, on my signal. And that's it. I, I either get stopped out or I sit on it until my stuff says sell. Yeah. And I'd love to hear you talk about a little bit more um, how you balance different positions and you know, rotate between the different markets that you're trading in and maybe, you know, go long here and kind of hedge with another uh, asset type. Uh, so I'd love to hear kind of how you how you decide when to do that. Um, and, and yeah, what kind of indicators you're looking at it, whether it's positioning, COT, uh, what have you. So I don't really hedge for the sake of hedging. Mm -hmm. um, but I am always hoping that my the COT data and, and my process will take on an opposite side trade um, so that I can have a relative trade on there. Um, it, it's funny because if I don't have anything showing me, like let's say it's a risk on trade, let's say I'm long stocks, or I'm looking for some sort of risk off trade to hedge it. When there is nothing telling me that there's a sell in the risk, then that that's good because it means that risk is probably gonna keep going higher. So I don't really have any hedges on there, but hopefully at some point I do get something that's telling me the other way and therefore it becomes a relative trade. And, th and that's happened kind of recently. I've been long the NASDAQ um, for a few months and um, which has been good except for the last few weeks, it's been bad. But a couple of weeks ago, I started getting some other things on, you know, like short energy, short mm -hmm. RBOP, short yen. Um, so these have helped to reduce the risk in the long NASDAQ. And on a relative basis, you know, it's worked. Short gold also worked. So, um, and from there it becomes, that's where my sizing sometimes gets a little bit uh, changed from a risk management point of view, because now we have a portfolio and we're trying to look at the whole portfolio. Right, right. And so I start to change the sizing so that the relative sizing across the different positions becomes more equal. Because like, Let's say I get long the S and P on that low day. Um, well, that was a hugely volatile day, right? So my S and P position from the close to that stop at the low is going to be pretty small. So now I get short the R bob on a day when the volatility. So I'm going to be short like four R bobs for every S and P that I'm long. I don't really want that, so I'll, I'll balance it more out. Yep, makes sense, and. Um... I love to hear more about uh, your your COT charts and how you use them to decide, you know, uh, how is the market positioned and when would be the right time to to enter. And, and maybe if you'd be willing to share your screen and kind of walk through uh, one of your charts, one of your graphs, uh, I think that'd be a great way to explain it. So here is the COT charts and, and we produce these ourselves, mm -hmm. but there's plenty of places where other people make COT charts. I just was never satisfied with the way that they did them so we just did them ourselves um so here's an example this is the i talked about the r bob right mm -hmm. so this is the the unleaded gas chart all right there's three types of uh, of data on here you have commercial traders um and this is all done by the cftc right they if you're a commercial trader which means you actually have legitimate hedging needs you get lower margins, so therefore you get classified as a commercial trader. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is a speculator. There's two types of speculators. There's the large speculators, which is if you have to report your positions, it, it, once you get over a certain size in the futures market, you have to report it because mm -hmm. um, they're trying to stop people from you know cornering a market or something. So those are the large speculators, which is the blue on this chart. Mm -hmm. And then everybody else, um, is considered a small trader, which is the yellow on this chart. Mm -hmm. You've got red here, commercials you can see here, where, who are super short. Um, and then you have large speculators and small speculators who are super long, right? So at that point, I'm looking to get short. So I'm waiting until I get some form of market confirmation, right? Mm -hmm. um, which happened on, let's see if I can pull up this chart. Um, 
Let me pull this, see if I can pull this over for you. Mm -hmm. Yep, right? I, I see FinVis here, yep. So here's the chart for the asset, right? So it was right here on this day. Um, this was a reversal day on positive news, right? So I get short the close there, would have stopped against that day's high, and I just kind of sit short from there. And you can look at the date of that it was January 25th, right? Mm -hmm. And the date of this, you know, this was January 17th. So starting the 17th, I'm looking for where to get short. As it turned out, it was the 25th where I actually got short. And that's kind of how I use the um, the COT. And there's obviously COT for, you know, all this stuff, energies, equities, you know. Uh, you can see the NASDAQ, you know, this is where we were getting long NASDAQ, right? Mm -hmm. which was early January. You're seeing the speculators getting super short. You're seeing the commercials get super long. I'm looking for a news failure, which there were many of during January in, in, in the NASDAQ. But the first one I take and, and I get long and, and that's that's kind of how I use it. So in other words, speculators getting super short, market not going down as they expect on certain news, I get long. So just to, just to ask some clarifying questions, you're looking for, you know, a big divergence in what the different groups of people are doing and then looking for, you know, to really get extreme. So what, what kind of qualifies as extreme positioning uh, for you? So that's a good question because uh, how do you determine extreme? Um, and the way that I've done it is it, I turn this data into an oscillator in my system. Mm -hmm. And when the oscillator, you know, is over 95, I'm looking to buy. And when the oscillator is, you know, um, below five, I'm looking to sell. Gotcha. So you have to pick a period of time for that oscillator. You know, is it one year? Is it six months? Is it three years? You know, and there's a little bit of um, art there. A little bit of art there. And, you know, you can back test it, which is always very dangerous, you know. So this is where sort of. I will use a little bit of discretion in particular when it comes to things like hedging the portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm super long risk and I have a few things that maybe aren't showing me that they're, you know, below five on my oscillator. Maybe my oscillator is eight, you know what I mean? But I get a news failure. Well, then I'll short it anyway because I'm not going to count on my oscillator as being so accurate because um, that's a moving target. But I'm not going to short it if the oscillator is at 50, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's a few points off of where I need it to be and I'm getting a news failure and I need something to hedge my portfolio, then I will use some discretion on that and, and, and go for it. Yeah, makes sense. And can we actually go over what you were looking at to go long NASDAQ uh, into this year? I, I think that'd be interesting for people to see both looking at the COT as well as um, looking at the chart in FIVIS. So, I mean, this was it right here, you know? Yep. Um, it was here because we have the advantage of seeing what happened afterwards, but yeah. in live time, when you get here, right. Um, this is when I was looking to do it. So this was January 10th. Cause at that time, this was looking very much like the commercials were getting very long, which means the speculators are getting very short. Right. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, as the market went up, speculators sold more, you know, yeah. that's kind of unusual, but it was great because that's what helped. But so I'm looking to get long, you know, on, 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 on Jan starting January 10th um, mm -hmm. is when I was looking to get long NASDAQ. And then I don't remember exactly what the news failure event was on that after January 10th, but. Um, yeah, it was that CPI reading. Yeah. It's probably this one right here, yep. right? Yep. Yep. That CPI reading. So you can see it, hopefully, that the market went down, closed mm -hmm. up, and I get long there versus that low. And, and I just ride it. And stop, but yeah, and and what's kind of your methodology for exiting a position? So this is kind of how you enter, but what, what do you? How do you decide when to sell? So again, it's all based on the same thing. If I'm getting in because speculators are super short, and that's what my edge is, right? Mm -hmm. That they're going to have to cover, get squeezed, and get out. Once they are not super short anymore, I just take my profit. So when my oscillator goes to fifty, I take my profit. Gotcha. And yeah. people are like, well, why don't you wait until they get super long? And it's like, well, I could, but that's my, I don't know that they're going to do that. You know what I mean? Like, that's what my edge is, right? So I just trade my edge and get out. Does that mean the market can't continue higher after I get out? Doesn't mean that at all. The market might continue higher, but it'll just continue higher without me. You know, I take my piece and 
other people can take their piece. You know, at that point, trend followers and momentum traders will come in and they can ride that. That's their job. Right. My job is sort of being the turn picker. Yeah. You're, you're focusing on your zone of excellence, what you've studied and, and have done for years. Yeah. That's it. I do my thing and other people do their thing and, and we can all be happy. Yeah, perfect. And I love to actually talk a little bit about, uh, you know, edges in general in trading because, you know, my style is very different than yours. I, I'm much more in the trend following camp, looking for the turn than strength after the turn, kind of reconfirmation entering there. Um, but, you know, your, your style is very different. So I'd love to hear, you know, and I'll actually close your screen here. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, how do you define an edge in the markets and what advice would you have for people who are looking to develop an edge or, or study an edge? I think you have to be fair, you know, and, and, and the fair thing, what I mean by that is the fair thing is if you study your P&L, honestly, then you can tell if you have an edge, you know, you can't, you know, if you're losing money, then something's wrong. You know, you mm -hmm. can't keep doing, and I see people do it all the time. You can't keep doing the same thing just because you might believe it, right? Belief is a great thing when it comes to politics, when it comes to religion, when it comes to all these things, right? But belief in the market is a very dangerous thing, right? So you have to be honest about it, you know? Um, how to develop an edge, you know? To me, my whole process is really just the conclusion of, of the First Market Wizards book, quite frankly. At least it's yeah. my conclusion of that, right? I mean, you read. You know, it, it, that's why those books are so good. And there's other books like that. And there's other books out there. But these are people that have had success are, are telling you what they do to have that success. So, you know, reading, observing, trying, and, and having an open mind as to your p &L as to whether it's working. I think that's the key to really developing an edge, you know, keeping notebooks. I have tons of notebooks mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, where I used to keep, you know, daily logs of my trading and, you know, what was working and what was not working. And, you know, I, I had a few blowouts. And after the last blowout, which was during that sort of late 90s thing um, with Alan Greenspan, you know, I sat down and I went through all my notes and I was like, let's really try and figure out, you know, I'm sick of just playing around. You know, I'm getting too old to just play around. If I'm going to make a living doing this and if this is what I'm going to do, I really got to figure it out what works and what doesn't work. So I went through all my my trading journals and I went, all right, this is what's not working. Let's eliminate those. You know, a big part of getting to what's working is eliminating what's not working, right? That gets you closer to what's working, right? So I went through all that, tried to eliminate the things that weren't working for me. Day trading, out, you know, um, and focused on the things that were working and really just tried to learn discipline to just focus on those, which is always hard to do. Right. There's always trades out there. The market is always moving. There's always mm -hmm. something you can do. But the discipline is to not do it. Just do the things that, you know, over time work. Right. And be OK with, oh, I knew that I should have bought this and it went up. OK, good for you. You know what I mean? In retrospect, it's easy. Right. Um, but I think that's the key. Developing that discipline over time to not trade when it's not your thing. Right. Um, I know everybody struggles with that. I'm not going to lie. I still struggle with it, right? Yeah. Because um, I sit here and I watch the markets all day and, oh, I knew the market was going to do that. Oh, you know, I've gotten to a point where I don't do any of it and I'm fine with that, but I still, you know, curse and bang the table like, oh, I knew it, you know, that whole thing. But I don't do it because, uh, you know, at this point, I, I do this professionally. You know yep. what I mean? And it makes it a lot easier to be disciplined now for me because I do it professionally because I manage money for people. And when I was raising that money, I told them what I did and I told them to judge me based on that. Right. Because what this will give you at the end of the day, and I believe one of the main reasons people have me manage their money is clearly if I'm picking market turns, it's going to give my returns a negative correlation to their trend following returns. Right. Right. So that's what they're hiring. And that's what I asked them to hire me to do. I, you know, don't hire me because you're chasing my historical returns. Okay. I can't guarantee that those are going to last forever or whatever. Right. What I can come close to guaranteeing is that that negative correlation, just because of the way I, I approach trading is going to be there. So judge me on that. Right. 
is what I asked them to do. Do they do that? Who knows? You know what I mean? The first year I lose money. I'm sure they're all pulled on money, but you know, I, I, I judge them based on that. Or I asked them to judge me based on that. So therefore it makes it a lot easier for me to stay disciplined to that process because that's what I've told people I'm going to do. So that's really my job. My job is to do what I've told them I'm going to do. Yeah. So it makes it a lot easier for me to, uh, to stay disciplined to the process because of that. Yeah. And it seems like you have to, because it does seem like, you know, there might be multiple weeks or months even between the signals that you use in your process. And you just have to be patient and, and wait for, you know, things to set up how you, how you want them to set up. Yeah. Now, you know, I trade across 37 different markets. Yeah. So therefore there's always sort of something to be looking at or to be watching or to be waiting on to trade and all that. It's very rare that I have no trades on. If I yeah. were just trading the stock market, then I would probably have no trades half the year at least. Right. Um, but because I trade across a bunch of different markets, there's kind of always something out there. Yeah. And I'm curious, how did you handle kind of the 2022 um, period? Because, you know, in the equities market, that was pretty much, you know, things were just trending down. There wasn't much to do. There were some counter trend rallies in there, uh, but not much uh, else. Um, everything was just in, a, in kind of a bear. How did you personally handle that period? So we came into 2022 short. I was getting short uh, in November of 21. And I sat on those shorts for the better part of the first half of the year. Um, and then we got out. Things got neutral, got out. And I didn't really have any equity trades um, until sort of later in the year where we started getting long. Gotcha. Um, and, but in the meantime, yeah. there were other trades, you know, going on. Yeah. And uh, just going back to the other kind of more recent correction, uh, bear market, the, the 2020 uh, correction, you know, that was a very quick move. I wonder how kind of your system handled that. That was the uh, COVID thing? Yeah, the COVID correction. So that was sort of interesting because usually what happens is obviously as the market keeps going higher, speculators keep getting longer because of the trend following and chasing it and all that. And so I'll catch the turn. 2020 was interesting. And also makes sense because it was an out of the blue thing. Yeah. Um, but like I wasn't short pre-COVID, right? Yeah. Um, but what happened was the COVID news first hit. And we know now what COVID was, but we didn't know then, you know. So the COVID news first hit, the market sold off for about a week. Yeah. Um, and people bought the crap out of it they bought that dip because they didn't know that COVID was going to be this thing, right? It seemed like, oh, it might be like bird flu or it might be like SARS and people kind of blew it off as something not that big. And they bought the crap out of that dip. So after that first week dip, my stuff started showing, okay, now they're way too long. And the market kind of rallied a little bit and then had a news failure in there and I got short there. And then, so I caught that second big wave of the move down. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, then everybody started panicking and they got out and, you know, I got out of that. And then at some point also was strange. I didn't get long at the low, but what people ended up doing was selling into the first part of the rally. Mm -hmm. They thought the rally was going to be false because COVID was going to end the world. Um, they sold into that. And then at some point I got along into there about two weeks after the, or three weeks after the beginning of the rally, I got along into that and, and rode that for pretty much, um, the whole way i was long something i swear from three weeks after the bottom of COVID, i was either along the dow or the s p or the nasdaq or the russell something basically all the way up until uh november of uh 2022 yep. and again this isn't me it's not like oh look how great i am i was long that whole time it's the data it's the process i mean i always say it's not me it's cot right they were telling me that people weren't getting long. So therefore I was riding along. It was as simple as that. And then they puked long into, yep. uh, into the end of 2022. Everybody was, I still remember it because I, you know, I write this newsletter. So I have the history of everything that I was thinking and everything that I was seeing, which is why I've always written that. Like the newsletter I distribute now on my site. Oh, it is, is what I used to write for myself every weekend to keep my thoughts um, organized. In yeah. Place. So that I can go back and look at things. And, and there's a ton of things on there that I was totally wrong about, you know, and that's really where I learned my best lessons from. I get to go back and read these historically. Oh, what was I thinking then? Oh, well, that was completely wrong. In fact, what I said at the end of 2022 in my newsletter was 
I'm getting short stocks here and I'm super bearish here. But then I created this whole thing behind it. Like I don't, I kept saying, I don't think that the Fed's going to raise rates once because the stock market is going to be so bad and the asset market is going to be so bad that they're not going to be able to afford to raise rates even once. Right. That was completely wrong. Right. right. Um, I also said that I didn't think there was going to be a, a, a midterm election because I thought things were going to get so bad that there was going to be blood on the streets and people were going to have their pitchforks out. Right. That was completely wrong. <laughs> but the good part is what was right was that I was short the stock market for the first half of the year and, and the market went down a lot. So the important part, I guess, uh, w w and the only part that really matters is that, you know, um, I heard a guy say uh, the other day who's been very bearish this whole year mm -hmm. um, that he's actually been right on almost everything he said, meaning that he thought there was going to be higher inflation and he thought the Fed was going to do this and that. So he said like, you know, I've been right on just about everything except the stock market. I'm like, yeah. okay, that's wonderful. But I mean, the stock market is what we trade. So that's the only thing you need to be right on, you know? Um, so I forget what the point was, but yeah. yeah. There, there's being right and then there's making money, right? And they're kind of yes. two different things. Which one do you want to do? As make a trader, money. Yeah, you know, you want to make money. Who cares if you're right? I mean, Druckenmiller is the king of that. He, he, yep. he, he admits that all the time, right? He's like, I think his quote was like, I'm wrong far too often to count on being right to make money, right? right. Um, and I think that's really the point. Who cares? You want to prove to your friends how smart you are or do you want to make money? My friends think I'm a moron. Yeah. And uh, do you have a sense of kind of what your, your batting average, like how often you are wrong versus being right and also kind of your average gain and average loss uh, on your yeah, positions. so I know it pretty much exactly. About thirty-seven percent of my trades end up being profitable, but they pay off about four to one, four and a half to one. Nice, really the number. Nice. So that's really what you want to do, right? Or at least maybe not what you want to do, but it works. You want to make yep. money over time, so that those numbers work. Thirty-seven percent get paid four and a half dollars. You know, the other whatever sixty-three percent lose a dollar. You know, lose one, lose one, make four. Lose one, lose one, make four. And then yep. just let time pass, right? As long as you're disciplined to the process, right? Right, right. And going back to uh, that 2020 turn, uh, I wonder if you do, I, I'd love to see the charts there, the COT charts, if, if you've got them handy. If it's a huge ordeal, uh, it's okay. But I, I'd love to kind of walk through both the bottom and also the top uh, that you were looking at. So these charts are only going back through a year. Okay. So I don't have the longer term one, but... Let me see if I can find it somewhere else. It's possible. So here's COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So coming in, this is the COT, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is the, the commitment of trader stuff, my index commitment of trader stuff. So you can see here, it really wasn't anything, right? Mm -hmm. The red is the number one thing here, right? Because the commercial position is the red. Mm -hmm. And that's always going to be equal and opposite to the speculator position. Right, because net net it's zero. If these guys are short, these guys are long. Right, right. So you can see coming in, it was neutral, but then it dropped, and people bought the crap out of it. You see the red here went to zero. Right? right. So the commercials are at zero, which means the speculators have been buying, the commercials have been selling. Right. So I got the sell on this failure day. You can see it there. Right. Sell went neutral here, got out, and then it took a few weeks before. The speculators ended up selling into it, getting short, and the commercials were long. And then I got long here and kind of, you know, rode this S and P. And then at some point it became a Nasdaq, and at some point it became a Russell. But um, that's kind of what it did during that period. And you can see here too, I was selling it here and got stopped. You know, here I sold it and I lost one day worth of volatility. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a losing trade. Right? Well, the winning trade is, you know, you catch it from here to here, right? That more than makes up for this little loss right here, right? Right. And and just a question here, you know, it was extremely volatile during during that fall. Uh, are you adjusting your position size because of that volatility or you just no. kind of look at where the, the that high is there, where you're placing your stop? That's it. I put the size on once and the, like I say, the only thing that gets adjusted is if I'm taking an offsetting position or something like that, but... In this case, it was going down so far, so fast, that I really didn't even have to adjust it because it was just, you know, every morning you woke up and we're making money because the market was basically, you know, crashing. So it's a lot easier when it happens that way. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. Yep. Yep. 
And uh, one of my favorite, and I'll, I'll stop your sharing. One of my favorite questions to ask is, and you've talked about this a little bit, your, your newsletter. I love to hear about your routines, both on a daily basis, as well as a weekly basis uh, to kind of set yourself up and, and make sure that you're following your process and being disciplined and basically following your rules. So yeah, I'd love to hear kind of what you do uh, routine wise. Yeah. So on the weekends, I write this, uh, this newsletter, like I say, it gets distributed now, but it used to just be for me. Yep. And therefore I know what I want to do. You know, here's the markets that I'm looking at, you know, um, maybe there's three markets that are showing on this COT stuff that they're a buy or a sell. Okay. Well, I'll go through, I already probably am going through it, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through again. What's been driving this market? What's the psychology behind it? What's the news behind it? What are the news events that are going to come up this week that might change that right. and, and trigger a trade? Um, and so then I'm ready. You know, I know I'm, I'm looking to get long stocks. Mm -hmm. um, CPI is coming out on Wednesday, right? So I know that that might be the trigger. So I'm waiting for that to come out and, and see, or whatever it is. I'm looking to short, you know, soybeans. And there's a, you know report coming out on Tuesday, you know, the WASDA report is coming out on Tuesday. And I'm hoping that will be more bullish than expected and the market will fail on that. So, you know, I have that kind of mark. Okay. Tuesday, this report's coming out. Um, and that's really it. And besides that, I, I'm sitting here in front of the markets, watching them all the time. And, and the main reason that I do that, I don't really necessarily need, as they say, to do that, but I like to do that because I really like to keep an eye on, on the correlations, right? So that when I am adjusting on a more discretionary basis, this risk management thing of a portfolio, um, I have a good feeling for what the correlations are. You know, I could run value at risk and all that, but I've always found that to be garbage over time. I think I can do a lot better job of looking at correlations just by observing them than by trying to measure them because those things are so historical. Mm -hmm. um, correlations change a lot quicker than value at risk picks it up. So um i i just like to watch the markets to watch for these correlations over time yeah and, and looking at those correlations that's kind of what would make you change position sizing a little bit comparing your different positions or you just kind of look at that to see where you might your next play might be yeah both i would both. say yeah. yeah yeah very cool um and you know because it's such an important point um i'd love to come back to you what you just kind of mentioned with when it comes to news failures, could you define that once more and kind of give, you know, one more example about what a news failure could be? So let's say you're looking to get long fixed income, mm -hmm. which would be sort of a super contrarian trade right here. Right. Um, well, what's been driving fixed income markets obviously is the inflation stuff, right? So let an inflation number come out that's even more inflationary than was expected. And then let uh, let fixed income close up on the day, on the back of that. Um, and that's where I get long. And, and just uh, as an example, that happened last Thursday on the PPI number, mm -hmm. was stronger than expected. And the two-year notes um, closed up on the day. Yeah. Um, so I got long versus the low of that day, which the low of that day got taken out two days ago and I got stopped, mm -hmm. you know, so now I'm looking again for higher inflationary numbers or the news failure to get long again. And that's really kind of how it works. It doesn't have to be, you know, and people make it harder than it needs to be. I think it, it should be so obvious that you shouldn't even, Hey, was this a news failure today? Well, if you have to ask, then it wasn't is how I look at it. Right. It should be so obvious, yep. <laughs> you know, that you shouldn't even have to question it, right? You should almost be like, I can't buy this because the news was so bad. How the hell am I going to buy this? It should be like that, you know? Um, yeah. So that's what I'm like. Yeah, that's great. And and on those days, are you taking into account what the volume is at all or it's really just the price reaction that you care about? It's the price reaction. It will usually be on a heavy volume day because you had such a big news event, but right. you know, I, I'm not really looking at volume. I'm looking at the price reaction. Yeah, it makes sense. And um, do you have any kind of general advice for uh, traders out there who want to take this more contrarian approach uh, to trading? 
will say again, I think the single most important thing if you're trying to take a contrarian approach to trading is wait for market confirmation. Otherwise, it will run you over, you know. Um, you have to wait for market confirmation before you do it. And if you've been looking to buy natural gas for the last six, four, three, two months, there really hasn't been any market confirmation. So it would have kept you out of a lot of trouble, just as an example. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Jason, this has been really fun because, again, this is kind of very different than to what I do personally. But those same kind of concepts are, are reinforced manage your risk even if you've got a low betting average if, if your winners pay for your losers if you keep those small it will work out eventually probability wise um where can people find out more about you and learn more about your process and and what you would do on a day-to-day -day basis so we have this crowded market report.com which started um after that book came out um with jack schwager a lot of people were sending me like linkedin things asking me if I could help them learn how to trade, asking me if I could help to mentor them and all that. And um, I'm all for that. I'm mean, sort of the, 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 the part of my life and the age in my life where you do want to help people and you do want to try to give back. People helped me mm -hmm. and you, you sort of pass that along. But it's impossible for me to help, you know, 200 people at the same time, right? Because um, I do have a day job and I do have a family and I have things going on. So one of the people, and that's what I was saying to people. I said, I'd love to help you. I just don't know how I can help 200 people. And one of the guys said to me, well, why don't I start a web page and, and maybe you can centralize it there. So I said, yeah, if you want to do that, then, then go right ahead. And uh, he did. And within that, I said, you know, I think what we can do on this web page is I can distribute this newsletter and that, well, I can distribute my weekend thing, which then became a newsletter. Right. Um, and that can help people. And I'll put stuff on there about trading and about this and about that. And we can make some videos on YouTube, which we also, you know, you've seen them, which is will drive traffic, obviously, to the web page and all that. Um, so that's kind of how that started. And it, it, it's turned into this really cool thing because I didn't know what a Discord page was being 55 years old. But he put a Discord page on there. Um, which has been super cool because we have people from all over the world on there that trade all different kinds of styles. And, you know, you mentioned like, oh, this isn't what you do, but because you're not a futures trader or whatever. But the truth is this stuff can help with a lot of stuff. Like if right. we're looking and saying, okay, the NASDAQ is giving a buy and yet energies are giving a sell. Well, if you trade equities, you can take advantage of that, right? You can get short the energies, the XLE relative to the NASDAQ. And I mean, and look what that's done, right? I right. mean, we were getting a short in gold four weeks ago, right? Um, and you can even look at it like, I'm not saying you have to trade like me. In fact, I tell people, don't trade like me. Trade like you. Just help. This stuff can help you trade like you better, hopefully, right? Right. right. So if you're like looking to be buying, you know, gold miners and all that, and it's like, well, the COT is saying that see people are super long gold and, you know, maybe I should hold back on that at the very least, right? I mean, like you look at what's gone on in the last, you know, month, Newmont mining is down like 20 something percent in, in three, four weeks. So it can really help with that stuff as well. You don't have to just be trading futures or you don't have to just be trading counter trend, you know, contrarian like i'm doing it, it it can really help over time like i always say the best thing about cot is it can help keep you out of trouble right which is a big part of making money over time right if you can avoid losses then you know it, it helps you make money over time so that's kind of where we started so people could certainly go on the youtube thing and um you know all those videos are free so see if they like what they see if they wanted to join the the, the other thing that that'd be great too um i'm on twitter you know i put some things on twitter sometimes about that in fact i put that whole idea of long nasdaq versus short uh Energy. gold miners oh, and, and all that i put that on twitter a few weeks ago um so plenty of places if they want to if they want to check it out perfect yeah i'll have those links down below and do you have any last advice uh for traders out there maybe it's about you know more of the trade psychology side of things becoming more disciplined sticking to that strategy and kind of eliminating everything else and eliminating that other noise i think that's it man have a process be disciplined the rest is is bullshit you know what i mean you're not going to predict the future over time okay it's just not going to happen right uh, you, you might think you're the smartest person in the world and you might be the smartest person in the world for all I know, 
but you're not going to be smarter than everybody put together, which is what the market is, right? That's impossible. Right. So trying to trade that way is going to be very, very, very difficult, right? So you have to have a process. I don't care what the process is, but you have to have a process and you have to stay disciplined to that process. And then you have to hope that that process is correct. And if it's not, you'll know because your P&L won't be working. So you'll change your process. You'll learn from it. You know, this is consistently learning, right? This has been, I always say this is probably the hardest thing in the world to do, right? My number one advice to people when they ask me, you know, they want to be a trader, I say, go to law school, right? Um, but if you're not going to do that and you're going to be stupid, like I was, and you're going to be stubborn and this is what you want to do, you have to develop a process. You have to be disciplined. That's the key to this whole thing. Trading is discipline period. Right? So I'd say that's it. And, and, and don't let these ideas of, oh, I put this trade on and it works. So I must know what I'm doing. You know, I mean, the market's either going to go up or down. Right. And you're either going to be long or short. So just because you happen to get that one right doesn't mean a damn thing. Look at your PL over time. Be very disciplined about that process too. Be honest and be disciplined. Is what I'm doing really working? And if it's not, well, then I've got to I've got to figure out what is going to work. That'd awesome. Be my, that'd be my advice. Yeah, I think that's an awesome way to end it. So Jason, thank you so much for your time. Uh, definitely go ahead and check out his links down below. If you enjoy this video, go ahead and leave a like down below. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in future videos. Thank you.